All right, we'll go ahead and jump back in. Uh, we've talked about the reaction. We've talked about the mess of products you can get. We've talked about how the reaction is an equilibrium, how you can control the outcome of the reaction creatively by using terminal alkenes and by doing ring closing reactions um, to drive the reaction towards a favored intramolecular metathesis product. Uh, all, you can use the problems in the chapter to work on some of these issues. I want to just talk about the mechanism now to give you, give you a sense for why the intramolecular reaction is faster. Uh, in order to understand the mechanism, it's, it's useful to break it up into two pieces. This is the Grubbs catalyst that we've talked about before with this particular alkylidine ligand. Uh, ultimately, though, the thing that's going to be cycling through many, many rounds of reaction is uh, a slightly different catalyst where the alkylidine ligand with one hydrogen and one benzene ring has been replaced by an alkylidine ligand that's just a CH2. This comes from the substrate that is from one of the terminal alkenes on the substrate molecule. Um, I forget whether this, what I'm gonna show you is in the text or not, but uh, as we show you the reaction mechanism and the catalytic cycle, what's actually cycling through and turning over many times, it's actually this. So we'll call this the active catalyst and it takes a few steps to get from the pre-catalyst to the active catalyst. Uh, the steps that we're gonna introduce though are examples of the kinds of things that go on during the um, actual catalytic cycle anyway. And so will be a good introduction for that. So here's the pre-catalyst, here's the active catalyst. Um, so new reaction. The ruthenium catalyst encounters one of my starting materials, okay? Uh, we're not actually saying what this is and we'll try to keep the reaction pretty simple. What happens is uh, called a two plus two cyclo addition um, and this involves converting the two pi bonds in the ruthenium carbon uh, pi bond and then the other one the carbon carbon pi bond here in the substrate to sigma bonds and effectively we're going to do this uh, pi electrons are going to attack this carbon to form a new pi bond. Hmm. It's tough to push arrows for a cycloaddition reaction. Let me move some stuff out of the way so we've got more. Oh, that's why it's a problem. Okay, sorry. Having to back up. It's always good to consult one's notes. Sorry for the erasing that's going to have to happen. Uh, before anything can happen, the phosphine ligand, one of the phosphine ligands dissociates. This is probably because um, the complex is coordinatively saturated. So if we want anything else to happen, you have to have the ligand dissociate first. This opens up a spot. Uh, for the, sorry, talking slow, opens up a spot for the substrate to bind to the ruthenium catalyst. So we lose the phosphine ligand, then the substrate binds
to the metal. It binds via, as an L-type ligand, the pi electrons are simply coordinating the metal. I can't write the number three, that's frustrating. <coughs> and then here's that weird alkylidine ligand. What happens next is the two plus two cycloaddition I was referring to. So, the pi electrons attack this carbon to form a new sigma bond, and then these pi electrons attack this carbon to form a new sigma bond. That's called a two plus two cycloaddition because you're taking two carbons here and two carbons there, and you're forming new sigma bonds. But the sigma bonds that you're forming are one is a carbon-carbon sigma bond and the other is a carbon-metal sigma bond. So I'm gonna draw in red the two new bonds that we're forming. <clears throat> okay. And that is called a metallocyclobutane. It's a four-membered ring involving a metal. And we've traded the two pi bonds to, for uh, two sigma bonds. <clears throat> I'm gonna actually draw in the other hydrogens on this carbon that are implied but not shown. And if we want, we can label this one pink and this one blue, pink and blue. All right, then what happens next is what we're going to call a retro two plus two. And uh, these electrons are going between, uh, let's see, this carbon, the electrons in this carbon ruthenium bond are going to kick down here. And then the electrons in this carbon-carbon bond are going to kick up here. So that reestablishes the new, that reestablishes the pi bonds and trades some of the sigma bonds for pi bonds. That generates this active catalyst and then it also generates a byproduct in which the blue carbon is bonded to what was originally the alkylidine carbon. So here's the blue carbon and here's the alkylidine carbon. I'm showing the trans version. You would probably also get some of the cis version. I'm gonna label the original alkylidine carbon throughout all of these drawings. And so you can see sort of what happened. By the two plus two cycloaddition, we made a new sigma bond between green and blue carbons and a new sigma bond between metal and pink carbon. Then by the retro two plus two, we traded the sigma bond between uh, metal and pink carbon and the sigma bond between uh, pink and blue carbons for these products. All right, questions about that? The cycloaddition is, step is new. That looks vaguely like something you saw in the Diels-Alder reaction. If we had another couple of lectures we would talk a lot more about those kinds of reactions but we don't okay so the first two plus two trades two sip two pi bonds for two new sigma bonds the retro two plus two trades two sigma bonds for two new pi bonds so the blue pi bond here and the blue pi bond there come from this step. Um, 
this is not a product that we show in the reaction. This is a byproduct that is formed only in vanishingly small amounts. Why do I say that? Because this reaction is catalytic and you only have a very small amount of catalyst present. So there's not very much of the green carbon present to begin with. You, you do this step once, you generate the active catalyst, and you form a little bit of this, but because you may be only, there may be only 1% or less of starting catalyst per substrate, you don't form very much of this at all, and people generally don't worry about it. All right. Uh, so then let's talk about the actual catalytic cycle involving our active catalyst. Okay, so, um, and maybe I'll do this on a new page so it'll print nicely. All right, so this is our active catalyst. The first step is going to be ligand binding. So we're going to have another one of our uh, olefin molecules associate with the metal. We'll use a dotted line to indicate that that olefin is binding the metal as an L-type ligand. Then here's that terminal CH2 group that's the alkylidine ligand on the active catalyst. Here's the other phosphine ligand, and here's the two chlorides. Then we'll do uh, 2 plus 2 cycloaddition. And if you want, we can show it like this. This takes a pi bond from the substrate and converts it into a carbon carbon sigma bond. And this takes a pi bond from the alkylidine and converts it to a metal carbon sigma bond. The product that we get is, from this step, is the metallocyclobutane. And importantly, you can see that we just made a sigma bond. I'm going to maybe keep the bonds that we just made there in red. We just made a sigma bond between the two pink carbons, the two CH2 groups. That's the sigma bond in ethylene that we're ultimately going to lose. Okay. Then we're going to do a retro 2 plus 2, which I'm going to just do for retro, I'll use the minus sign. <coughs> In that retro 2 plus 2, I'm going to take the electrons from this carbon ruthenium bond and move them here to make a carbon carbon pi bond. And then I'm going to take the electrons in this carbon carbon sigma bond and move them here to make a carbon ruthenium pi bond. So at this stage, that's the stage at which we lose ethylene. as a gas that bubbles off and is no longer involved in the equilibrium. And then we're left with a new alkylidine ligand, only this time it's from our substrate. So, um, sorry, I'm scrolling up to Sorry, scrolling all over the place. I realize that's distracting. And I realize that we're changing sort of the size of everything. Things are getting smaller as we progress. So there we go. 
All right, so this is the first half of the catalytic cycle. On either side of the catalytic cycle, we have this metal alkylidine species. Only up at the top of the catalytic cycle, it's a CH2 group that's bonded to the metal. Our substrate, just so you can keep in mind where we are, is the olefin where we've got the blue carbon and the terminal pink carbon. And let's suppose that the product that we're going to get, the metathesis product, is going to be the self-metathesis product of the substrate, the two blue carbons linked to each other, and then of course the other product is going to be ethylene, which is going to bubble off. That's to sort of keep you oriented and help you know where we're going. So notice that in the first half of the catalytic cycle, we go from the metal alkylidine, we get ligand binding, we get two plus two cycloaddition, retro two plus two, that spits out ethylene, and, but it gives us a new metal alkylidine where the, where the blue carbon is bonded to the metal. All right, the next half of the cycle is going to involve exactly these steps, ligand binding, two plus two, and retro two plus two. It's going to generate two things that are gonna ac be accomplished in this second half of the cycle. We're gonna generate this product and we're going to regenerate the metal alkylidine catalyst. So, as you would expect, step four is another ligand binding step, a second molecule of substrate, again with blue and pink carbons, is going to bind to the metal to form a pi complex. We're going to orient it this way. so that the blue carbons are close to each other. Oops. All right, so that's the pi type complex. Then we'll do the two plus two cycloaddition, that's step five, to give us the metallocyclobutane. Again, that's going to look like this. Pi electrons from the alkene make a new carbon-carbon pi bond. Pi electrons from the carb from the metal alkylidine make a new metal carbon sigma bond. So the product looks like this. Here's the new carbon-carbon pi bond between blue carbons. And here's the new metal carbon sigma bond between the ruthenium and the metal. This is another metallocyclobutane. Chloro ligands here, phosphine ligand here. And then a retro step six is the retro two plus two, where again, oops, I wanted this to be blue. Let's take um, electrons in the metal carbon sigma bond and move them here to be the carbon carbon pi bond, and then we'll take electrons in the carbon-carbon sigma bond and move them here to make the metal carbon pi bond. I should have continued to label that one pink, sorry. That's going to spit out our metathesis product.
plus the cis isomer, and the ratio of those is going to sort of depend on their relative stabilities, and then that regenerates the metal alkylity. Okay, that's a lot to talk through, but that's actually how the process goes. And we continue mm -hmm. to cycle through, and each turn of the cycle, we spit out another molecule of ethylene on step three, and then in the back half of the cycle, we spit out our metathesis product. So you can see why the intramolecular ring closing metathesis product is fast, because imagine this R group or something else, just for a minute, Let's imagine that's one, two, three, four, five, six. There's your next pi bond. That accelerates step four, the ligand binding step, because the metal alkylidine here, the second metal alkylidine, doesn't have to wait around to find another olefin. The olefin that's going to bind in ligand binding step four is already there, and that's an intramolecular binding process. All right. Questions about that? Yeah. This hopefully this isn't redundant. I just want to talk about this, but what is keeping like those substrates from just binding on a regular um, like palladium um, ligand, or like making a ligand with palladium, like we were doing beforehand? Okay. Um, with, like, Okay, so what's going on here that's preventing some other undesired reactions? First, there's no palladium in the, in the reaction. So we've only got the ruthenium metal here. Right. But you're thinking about... Like, how when we first introduced, like, um, metal ligand bonds and how we have, like, palladium and then phosphorus, like, could you just... I mean, you're showing how you could click things together that way. Could right. Could you just take the substrate and throw it in that type of reaction and click it together? Or um, is this, like, the only way you can... So let's see if I understand the question. Yeah. I'm not sure. I, I think what you're asking is that you've seen before. Uh oh, just lost where we were. You've seen a reaction with a terminal olefin before in a heck reaction, and you're sort of wondering why isn't that going on here? I think it's because of the, it's got to be because, and this is sort of outside my area of expertise, so my answer is going to be sort of hand wavy. It has to do with the differences between ruthenium and palladium. In the heck reaction, we were doing oxidative addition where we're oxidizing palladium zero to palladium two. Ruthenium is a little bit earlier in the table than palladium. Notice it would normally, instead of having 10 D electrons, it only has eight. We're at a higher oxidation state for ruthenium already. Uh, I'm not sure how to handle the alkylidine ligand. I simply need to look it up. But at least here, there the two chloro ligands are X type. So we're at least ruthenium two. We might be ruthenium three or ruthenium four. An oxidative addition step would require you to go to ruthenium six. And of course, the more electrons you remove, the harder it is to remove additional electrons. So my guess is we're not doing the kind of steps that you've seen before in the Heck reaction and the Suzuki reaction, because we're already at a decently high oxidation state for ruthenium. So that is just inaccessible. Yeah. Okay, others, yeah. On the ligand binding. No, uh, ligand binding step, so that's the alkene ligand coordinates the metal. I think you're talking about the two plus two cycloaddition step, yeah. and I think you're asking, could I not have pushed the arrows this way? In fact, as I was talking through it, I was like, okay, these electrons form this sigma bond, these electrons form that sigma bond. With cycloadditions, you can always draw the arrows the other way, and it's always fine. 
that was also true of the Diels Alder reaction. They happen at the same time. We don't really have a way of tracking which electrons go where. But what we do know is you trade two pi bonds for two new sigma bonds. Okay, other questions? All right, I wanna tell you a brief story about uh, developments in, in research that have involved this reaction um, and applied it to sort of development of new, new drugs. Um, I wanna just give you sort of a 30,000 foot view of it without delving too much into details. Um, so we'll call this to, we'll call this olefin metathesis in um, peptide drug development. Okay, and, and we're gonna draw a bunch of cartoons. This, what we're gonna talk about is like more than 20 years of research and uh, you could spend a lot of days sort of talking about this, but We'll try to keep it, and, and I don't understand a lot of the cell biology at a very deep level at all, so what I'm gonna tell you is necessarily cartoony and abbreviated. Uh, for example, behold the alpha helix. Now, you've seen an actual three-dimensional structure of an alpha helix before. You know that the alpha helix involves hydrogen bonding between an I position carbonyl oxygen and an I plus four position ambient nitrogen, kind of like this. Um, what you may not know is that short peptides generally don't, and by peptide I'm talking about an oligomer of amino acids, short peptides generally don't form alpha helices spontaneously in solution. The reason for that is that um, the amount of energy you, you uh, release by forming these hydrogen bonds isn't enough to compensate for the entropy that you lose when you restrict all of the phi and psi dihedral angles in the peptide to form an alpha helix. It's sort of an enthalpy entropy trade-off once helices get beyond a certain length, then you pass that threshold and then it's fine. But at least at a short, we're talking about 10 to 15 amino acids, most of these peptides don't spontaneously form alpha helices. So that's important observation one. Short peptides don't spontaneously form helices. Observation two is that helices are often important in key protein-protein interactions that uh, are important in cancer. So this is the cancer biology that I'm weak on and that you can learn about. Uh, but there are a family of proteins, uh, BCL2 family proteins, and then other proteins with BH, what are called BH3 domains, that have both pro and anti apoptotic, apoptotic properties. Uh, if you don't know what apoptosis is, apoptotic, I can't spell, is part of the problem with me. Anti apoptotic capabilities. If you don't know what apoptosis is, this is programmed cell death. It's a series, a cascade of signals that, in, that induces a cell to die. Um, and it's one of the ways that you could imagine uh, using to treat cancer. If there was a way to tell a cancer cell, you go ahead and die, that would be great, right? Then you wouldn't get cancer, the tumor wouldn't grow, and metastasize and so on. Of course, you don't want regular cells to die, and so regular cells have ways of suppressing apoptotic signals. Uh, and there's a sort of balancing trade-off between these two things, and there are peptides and proteins that are involved in inducing apoptosis 
and then suppressing apoptosis. So there's a particular uh, one of these interactions between um, a protein called BCLXL, which I'm going to draw as sort of Pac-Man, but not even like Pac-Man. And BCLXL binds a protein uh, uh, called BAC. And the relevant portion of BAC that binds to BCLXL is a helix. So we're looking down on the helix spiral. We're looking down from the end of the C terminus down the helical axis. And the helix binds in this cleft. And when it's bound in that cleft, I think back, I'm trying to remember the cell biology. I'm embarrassed. My PhD advisor, I sat in so many group meetings where people were talking about this. My PhD advisor would be ashamed of me that I can't manage to pull out of my brain what it is. But I think back ends up being pro-apoptotic. But when BCLXL binds it, that signal is suppressed. Okay, so cancer cells know this, and so they will upregulate BCLXL to bind the pro-apoptotic prote pro, uh, protein to suppress the signal to die. And um, my PhD advisor explained this to me once by saying it's like you give cancer cells chemotherapy, they get damaged, apoptosis tells the cell to die, BCLXL in, invol allows the cell like a teen teenager to say, I don't care, and just keep on living anyway. And so you could imagine as a particular treatment for cancer that if you could break apart this interaction between BCLXL and BAC, you would free BAC to be able to do what it's supposed to do and the cell would die. Okay, so you got the strategy. The interaction between BCLXL and BAC is called a protein-protein interaction. And the idea is if we could design a peptide or a protein that bound even tighter to BCLXL than BAC, we could liberate BAC and it would be free to tell the cell to die. So organic chemists got to work and they started with the sequence of BAC, which is which forms when it's bound forms a helix and they thought okay let's make a mimic of BAC but let's but if we're going to make a short peptide and it needs to bind BCLXL it's going to need to be helical but making short peptides form helices is problematic so we need a strategy for that and about this time uh, there were scientists that had been watching what Bob Grubbs had done with metathesis reaction. And in Professor Grubbs' lab, there was a postdoc named Helen Blackwell who had this idea about using the metathesis reaction in an intramolecular sense. Now, you remember what I told you about the metathesis reaction and a molecule with two terminal olefins, you could do the ring closing reaction, right? Well, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Blackwell in Grebs' group had this idea. She said, if I have a peptide <clears throat> that isn't normally going to form a helix, but if I put an alkene side chain on one of the amino acids of the helix and then I put another alkene side chain for the other amino acid of the helix. If I put those two side chains spaced apart in the peptide such that they would be on the same side of the helix and then if I do olefin metathesis then I'm going to form a new carbon-carbon pi bond between the blue carbons. The pink carbons are going to be released. And I'm sorry, my squiggly line is changing. <clears throat> That's going to make a new covalent bond, which is going to basically act to structurally reinforce the helix. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm all over the place with the color here. Um, that's terrible, isn't it? 
Let's try. Uh, 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 there we go. There's my new sigma, my new pi bond. There's my new sigma bond uh, between the blue carbons. And and Blackwell reasoned that this covalent side chain <coughs> side chain linkage would reinforce the helix, it would force these two side chains to be close to each other in space. And she reasoned that might prepay some of the entropic cost of constraining the peptide to be in a helix. And it worked. Um, this strategy became uh, known as stapling. Stapling two side chains together I don't know if it's related to the fact that if you imagine that the molecule is paper, that this double bond looks like a staple or something like that. I don't know where they were coming from. But this, <coughs> this strategy became known as stapling. <coughs> it worked. The forward reaction where you cross-link the two blue carbons is driven by the fact that you're releasing ethylene. <coughs> And Blackwell showed that you could definitely make a peptide become helical in this way. Um, then <clears throat> a lab at Harvard uh, run by Professor Greg Verdine had the idea, oh, we now have a way to make something helical but short. Let's now apply that to BCLXL. Let's make a back version, let's make a version of back that is stapled via olefin metathesis maybe it will bind BCLXL better than back, and maybe we can use it as an inhibitor of the interaction. And it worked. And so ever since then, um, scientists have used olefin metathesis, and then not only olefin metathesis, but a whole host of other reactions to try to cross-link side chains on peptides and proteins as a way of reinforcing their structure uh, for use in lots of different applications. We're, 20 years later, we're still doing this kind of thing in my lab. Our purpose is not actually to inhibit protein-protein interactions. We just want to know <clears throat> in a general way how to use these kinds of reactions to make a peptide or protein more stable. It's pretty simple with an alpha helix. Uh, because we know the regular spacing of amino acid side chains in a helix, so we basically know how far apart to put the olefin amino acids in order to uh, link them and make the peptide more stable. But for other more complicated structures, it may not be as clear, and so we're still trying to tease that out. Okay, so that, I think, is all of the new content I had planned. There's much more we could have talked about, but we didn't. Now, I know you want to know about the exam, right? No, you don't care? OK, we're done. Um, OK, uh, question number one. How many questions are on the exam? 50. Question number two. Are you kidding me? That's twice as long as a normal exam, but it's only 250 points. No, I'm not kidding you, but actually, some of the questions are grouped together. For example, there's questions about glycolysis or the citric acid cycle, where you'd be filling in names or structures. And so they're sort of grouped together by topic. It's not like 50 different questions on 50 different things. Um, multiple choice, yes. Let's see what else. Five points per question, yes. Oh, uh, how much of it will be on chapters 27 and 28 versus any of the previous material? Um, answer, some. Question, could you be more specific? I could, but I won't. Um, <laughs> what if we ask nicely? Okay, you will probably feel like it oversamples chapters 27 and 28. There's gonna be questions about the Suzuki reaction, questions about the Heck reaction, there will be questions about metathesis, there will be questions about uh, glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and, and so on. There will also be other questions too. Precisely what percentage, I can't tell you. My guess is you will feel like it definitely oversamples the second half of the class. 
Uh, that being said, you know, it's probably worth reviewing areas where you're weak because there's definitely questions from earlier materials. Uh, let's see. Can I use a calculator? No. Can I use model set? Yes. Is it timed? No. You should, but it, it is available at the testing center and you want to pay attention to testing center hours. Finals week in a spring term is I believe finals two days. And I believe that's the 20th and the 21st. Other questions I didn't think of? Yeah. What do you want to shake them down or something? <laughs> uh, will the TAs have seen the exam? I don't know. Um, I have seen the exam, so it's, it's not helpful. But um, yeah, others? <laughs> yes. They should do a review, yes. How much time would you budget? How much time would I budget? Um, uh, I mean, uh, it varies from semester to semester, and frankly, widely from person to person, how long people spend on exams. I, get, I look at the times that people spend, and again, it's all over the place. So I don't totally know what to tell you. I would say budget a little longer than for a, a regular exam, but not a hugely amount longer. I, I would think in general it's designed to be taken in about the amount of time that's allotted for an in-class final, which is like three hours. I think it should take less than that. In general, people uh, spend an hour and a half to two hours. That's an average with an enormous standard deviation. So I would say see what you normally do, and I would say tack on a little bit more time than that just to be safe. Uh, I'd say it would be exceedingly unwise if you are um, to play chicken with the testing center and to show up if it closes at six and to show up at five and think you're going to be fine. But I think you all know that. So what else? Yeah. It is open all two days of finals week with no penalty. Yes. Okay. Right. Well, it's been a whirlwind. You guys were, um, I don't want to say crazy, but like you were taking this class in a spring term is gutsy. It's a gutsy move and you've, you've, you've done well. Performance on exam three was fantastic. I'm real pleased with how you've done. Uh, just do your best on this and it'll all be okay. So uh, I do have office hours today from 10 to noon. Let's see, Wednesday is a holiday, so I will not have office hours on Wednesday. If you have questions, I'm happy to respond to them via email. You can also email me if you need to come in and we can try to work around things. Uh, tomorrow or or during the days of finals week.